What a great conversation we're having with Dr. Carl Payne with so many things. He's on staff at the Antioch Bible Church in Redmond, Washington. He is a pastor, a teacher, a speaker, an author, and I just love his transferable cross-training program. Here's the tagline. And if you listen to this program with any regularity, you can see why for me personally, it's so appealing. Training Christian Soldiers for Spiritual Battle. And on the three books that are on the website, one, two, and three, one is called Essentials, two is called Apologetics, three is called Leadership, and each one has a soldier doing something different. One is drawing the sword, one is holding up the shield, and the third one is ready to fire an arrow. And that really speaks to the warfare that surrounds us that comes in all shapes and sizes and forms. And that's why a separate book that Dr. Payne has written is on spiritual warfare, which you all thought was terrific. We have some super questions, but I really, I want to go back because you raised, as you always do, Dr. Payne, such an intriguing point. All right, so here's the junk, the pain, the divorce, the abuse, the hurt, the disease, the firing, the financial threats. And here's the promise that I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. What is abundant about all that other stuff. And how does the believer who's in the word of the word, a maturing saint, reconcile all of that junk with the promise that we were supposed to have an abundant life in him? Janet, I think it's understanding and it's something maybe that we we really opened the program with, but ultimately it's keeping an eternal perspective. In other words, the Christian walk is not about me, it's about him. Uh, Galatians 2.20 says that my life ended the moment I committed my life to him. Romans 12.1 and 2 says I'm now supposed to live as a living sacrifice. The first three chapters of Ephesians, you cannot read it without understanding, here's what I've done for you, chapter after chapter, but it's according to my purpose for the good work that I've prepared for you to walk in. Uh, Verses that are memorized all the time of Philippians 2.13, it is God who is at the work and will for his good pleasure. It doesn't say for my good pleasure. Mm. Uh, James, we talked about last time that trials that's it if it's not if it's if it's tri- if there's a trial it involves suffering but the purpose he says in verses 2 through 4 are to strengthen me and a second corinthians chapter 2 verses 12 to 14 i remember reading this and i thought this was very odd it's in the leadership uh, one of the book the third book i said you know when paul says that he was going to troas to teach and god had opened the door for him and yet when titus didn't show up it shut down that preaching and he had to go on to macedonia and then he goes immediately in verse 14 but thanks be to god who always leads us in his triumph and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place i thought paul understood something because i'm afraid what i would have been saying is where's titus he let us down whatever he didn't bring to the table cost us ministry that god had opened up a door to and now we're having to pick up shop and go somewhere else why don't they make people of faith anymore? Where are those young people? Blah, blah, blah. And I think to myself, his immediate response, thank you, Lord. Thanks be to God who always leads us, not sometimes, always, in his triumph. It's not about my, my it's his, it's his show. And manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. I guess God has a better plan than I did. So if he wants me in Troas, I'll go to Troas. If he wants me in Macedonia, I'll go to Macedonia because it's his show. So when I'm going through tough times that look like, how could this be abundant life? How could this be from something I thought I was going to get health, wealth, etc., etc.? I go, are you looking through your eyes? or through the eyes Mm. of Christ. Ephesians 2.6 says, You're now seated in the heavenlies as a member of the body of Christ, far above all rule, power, and authority. It's positional, but it's still true. But again, it means I'm viewing life through him instead of it's all about me. So when we look at, and I mentioned these before, but when I look at 1 Peter 6 and 7, 1 Peter 2, 19 through 21, 3, 13 through 17, 4, 1 and 2 and 12 through 16, chapter 5, 9 through 11, 2 Timothy 1, 8, 2 Timothy 1, 12, 2 Timothy 2, 3, chapter 2, 8 through 10, chapter 3, 10 through 12, chapter 4, 5 and 7. When I start looking at verses like that, that promise, struggle, of uh, 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 1 Peter chapter 5, where he says, after you have endured, promises me the one who is the roaring lion is, is seeking to devour you, but you'll overcome this, and after you've overcome this, strengthen you know, uh, uh, your brethren with what you've learned. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, blessed be the God of comfort who comforts us through our affliction so that we can comfort others when they're in it. When I understand, it isn't about do I like it or not like it, it's about God <laughs> is equipping me to use me to accomplish mm. the good work he prepared, Ephesians 2.10 says, for me before the foundation of the world, and my job isn't to say, gosh, do I like this or not? Mine is to say, 
I know you watch out for the good. I know you see around the corners. I know you've promised to ultimately protect me and give me a way of escape through anything. If that's not true, then you're a liar, and you're not a liar. So apparently I can get through this, and I can get through it in an honorable way, or you would pull me out of here, and you're going to work it for my good. And like James, you're going to make me stronger through it. So why in the world should I go, what a bummer God is? I just go... I thought I was going to Troas, and we were going to do it this way today. Maybe God wants to send me to Macedonia. Okay, if he's sending me to Macedonia, Lord, let's see what you have on the plate. I tell people every day for me is an adventure, because I don't know who I'm going to talk to. I don't know what the questions will be, but it's God's job to prepare me. It's my job to do some homework, and then not judge God. Is he watching out for me or not, but realize he's making me strong. Let's go for it. Wow, wow, and that's how you get built up, isn't it? Oh, there's the athleticism, by the way, of the Christian life. Dr. Carl Payne is our guest. When we come back, we're going right to the phones. You are the one everlasting. You notice he didn't sing, I am the one. He said, you are the one. And there's the distinctive. There's the distinctive in the believer's life. The world says, hey, it's all about me. The Lord says, well, no, it's really all about me. He is God and we are not, as Dr. Henry Blackaby says so well. Dr. Carl Payne is with us, pastor, teacher, speaker, author, chaplain. He's on staff at the Antioch Bible Church in Redmond, Washington. And on the right-hand side of our website, we've got his transferable cross training set. Absolutely fabulous. All right, great questions. one 548 3675 Christine, I thank you so for your patience there in Illinois. We'll take your question and comment now, please. Yes, hi. Thank you for having me on your show. Um, I am calling because I was brought up um, and raised believing in the prosperity gospel. And now, um, as an adult, and, you know, I love the Lord with all my heart, I'm trying to balance that with the truth. And I guess I struggle with that sometimes. And and you kind of answered this question earlier, but how are we not supposed to expect God to do above and beyond all we could ever ask or imagine? Um, with the realities of life? I think that's a great question, Christy. I think (laughs) it would be a perspective of from whose perspective. In, In other words, is that always physical health, wealth, and prosperity? Because that's what I'm told sometimes. And I'm suggesting I believe God nowhere in the New Testament promises me an absence of conflict. What he promises me is peace, eternal, and victory through the conflict, which will make me stronger. I thought about 1 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, and 2 Corinthians 11. And all three of those chapters, uh, Paul or the different apostles speaking are talking about how you're treated like kings, but we're beat up. You have places to sleep, but we don't. We're treated like the 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 bottom of the bottom, but we rejoice for you. In other words, if the notion that Christianity guarantees physical blessing, and talking again typically about money and health, that's usually where it goes uh, in, in those type of situations, I'm going, I do not believe that you can show that biblically that is consistent I won't even, that's just being too nice. That is not what the Bible teaches. And I'm afraid that when someone goes into the faith with that expectation, usually what ends up happening is once they start taking a few hits, they don't want to blame whoever taught them that. So it just must be, I guess I failed. I must have not done something right. Back to the car analogy, I just must not be you know, adequately taking care of the car. It's my fault. And at some point, I just get tired. And I think... I don't know what's true anymore or not. So if someone says, is the expectation an eternal perspective, eternal peace? Uh, you know, how many times, I was reading uh, Proverbs 8 today, and, I, and I, I wrote a note in my Bible, if you saw my Bible. It says that, that silver is to be valued, that wisdom and knowledge are to be valued more than silver, gold, and jewels. And I wrote, we, we, tell, we say this, but we don't believe this because I want the silver, the gold, and the jewels. And yet I am told over and over that God's knowledge, God's wisdom, God's discernment, etc., is more valuable than what I see on earth, because as James says, the things of earth are fleeting. They're a vapor. But I kind of like what I see around here. So if someone says, don't you believe that God is going to take care of you? Yes. Don't you believe abundant life means a life with purpose? Yes. It will be perfect for me. 
whatever is perfect for me, God, I believe, will make good on that. But I don't think that necessarily means that because someone's idea of perfection is I'm always healthy, there have been powerful saints who have won many people to Christ through illness or through poverty, watching God at work, etc. In other words, to couch it in terms that guarantee me comfort and convenience, I hope I have it. I'd love to have it. I hope I'm generous with it. But it certainly doesn't mean that that's the end game or that was the promise. The promise was eternal life, eternal peace. Uh, We're supposed to focus on the things not that we see, but the things that we don't see. So if someone says, well, then you're saying God is guaranteeing you a horrible life, you know, come to Jesus and all you're going to do is get beat up. I'm saying, well, part of uh, – Janet mentioned this earlier, back in Philippians – or excuse me, Second Timothy chapter 2. We're called soldiers, and we're told we're going to suffer. Uh, we're, we're told the same thing in Philippians chapter uh, chapter 1. But on the other hand, we're also told we're going to reign with him, and we're going to be given great privilege and protection from him. So I'm just saying my focus, I want it to be on the book so I know I'm not being conned, and on the book so I understand, God, I want to see the things that you do. I want to see the things that you take care of in such a wonderful way. And if that happens to be financial or health, I'm, uh, trust me, I'm glad. But if it's you choose to use me in a different way, I still know you're going to work in my life and you're going to use me to accomplish your purpose. And my life was given to you at the cross, so do with me what you want. When that's the expectation, it's kind of like a friend, Christy. If if I have a good friend and I understand I don't have to have that friend, then that friend is a joy. But if I have to have that friend to feel like God, you know, loves me, that friend becomes a crutch, and that friend replaces God. It almost becomes an idol. So I'm going to say, yes, I want friends, but I can live with them or without them, because God will always be with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. I never go into any room alone. I've sometimes felt alone, and then I correct myself and check myself and go, hold it. That's not true. I go Mm. into situations with questions that people will throw them at me, and there's fear sometimes. You're thinking, what if I don't look good? And then you're going, well, this isn't about you. And God is the one who's prepped you for this day. And if he wants to take you home, he can take you home. But until he's done with you, he apparently has equipped you for this day. So instead of being fearful for the day, let's be soldiers and go for it and try and see the Lord Jesus Christ reflected through us. And if that's in prosperity, praise God. I hope people have it, and I hope that people who are prosperous are generous to the things of Christ. But if that happens to be another direction, praise God. For whatever reason, I'm not there. He knows more about me than I know about myself. I just want him to find me faithful. So like Paul, when we're all said and done, I hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what mm-hmm. I want to hear. Wow. Thank you so much, Christine, for being with us. One eight seven Larry in Florida, thank you for being here. And your question now, please. Thank you, Janet. Um, hello, Dr. Payne. Um, I was calling to get your perspective on uh, planning churches in areas where it seems like there's a proliferation of this prosperity gospel and a lack or a vacuum of the true unadulterated gospel. Um, is that something uh, that... It, it will inundate the surrounding community or oversaturate? Um, is that something that should be worked from the inside out? Or is there, in your opinion, a need for these Bible-teaching churches that will adhere to the truth regardless of the opinion of society? Let me. I'm going to take a stab at your question, Larry, and if I miss it, come back at me, okay? And I'm going to digress just for a second, because I want to be sure I'm not misunderstood on something else. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about some people preaching the gospel, you know, hoping to help him, and some people trying to preach the gospel just to exasperate him. And his ultimate line is, as long as Christ is being preached, I'll continue to rejoice. Mm -hmm. I am not trying to make an absolute enemy out of people that are involved in that type of situation. If they love Jesus, I'm still rejoicing for them. I just wish that they were more biblically based, I suppose is what I'm saying. But I don't want to get into a, gosh, they're charismatic. They're not charismatic. They think they can keep their salvation. They think they can lose their salvation. They're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. You know, let's, let's let's call them orthodox because of their view on the trib. In other words, I'm not going to get into that. If they love Jesus, I'm still rooting for them. 